On this episode, we talk with my friend Colonel Johnny Thoits about what it's like being retired in Thailand. So if you're thinking about living here once you're done slaving away for the man, you'll get a lot of info from this episode of the Bangkok Podcast. And welcome to the Bangkok Podcast. My name is Greg Jorgensen, a Canadian who came to Thailand in 2001 on a mission to stop people from pronouncing it Pattaya and tell them that it's actually Pattaya. And I'm still neck deep in the project, so you can tell how that's going. <laughs> when are you going to work on uh, Phuket? <laughs> <That's> next. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And I am Ed Knuth, an American who came to Thailand on a one-year teaching contract 20 years ago, fell in love with the belief that I don't have to exercise because I can just lose weight by sweating so much. God, can you imagine if that like that was a thing? Like, oh, that'd so, be great. Just, instead of sweating to the oldies, it'd be like just sweating to the Siamese or something like that. Just, <laughs> sweating to the Siamese. <laughs> how'd you lose so much weight? I moved to Bangkok for three yeah, years. Yeah, just, just hang out in Thailand, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> if, it, if it was only that easy. I wish. We want to say a quick thank you to one of our patrons who supports us at the show shout-out level. He wants to remain anonymous, though. So we're just going to keep it simple and ask you all to join us in raising a pint for JD. JD. Thank you for your support, kind sir. And a huge thanks to all of our patrons who support the show. Patrons get a whole bunch of cool stuff, including our ad-free regular show a day early, behind-the-scenes photos and videos of our interviews, discounts on swag, which you can find on our website, and various other things that aren't available to regular listeners. But best of all, patrons like JD also get an unscripted, uncensored bonus episode every week where we riff on current events and random topics we just finished recording this week's bonus show and we chatted about the first piece of grown-up art that greg bought and how greg doesn't have room for it anywhere in his place a story from the bangkok post that details the real drivers of the thai economy and the story of an online poker player who spent a few nights in a bangkok jail because his buddy's girlfriend didn't want to just get mad she wanted to get even sizzling to become a patron head to bangkokpodcast.com forward slash support i think the real reason i bought that art was so i could tell my wife like well now we gotta just move get a bigger place <laughs> that's a good strategy there's no other option <laughs> <laughs> i like that that's a good strategy <laughs> All right, well, on this episode, we are finally getting around to doing a show about a topic that a lot of listeners have asked us to do over the years, and that is retiring in Thailand. Now, obviously, Ed and I are in the prime of our lives. No doubt. And we aren't even thinking about retiring yet. So I turned to a very dear friend of mine who has been retired in Thailand for a number of decades, Colonel Johnny Thoits. Now, I know what you're saying, Colonel, cool nickname. But in fact, Johnny is an actual British colonel, retired, of course with all of the crazy stories, medals, and photos of him driving tanks to back it up, which we will, of course, send to our patrons. Um, I took a road trip up to Korat, where he lives a few weeks ago, to see him at his house, and Johnny and I managed to sit down to discuss why he retired here, how things have changed, and if he thinks that Thailand is still a good place for people to come and spend their sunset years. So here is my conversation with my good buddy, the Colonel Johnny Thoits. <laughs> All right, Johnny. Well, it's been 15 odd years since we met or so. And uh, I am very happy to be sitting you uh, sitting down with you as a guest on the Bangkok podcast. So welcome to the show. Well, thanks very much, Greg. It's great to see you again. <laughs> Has it been about 15 years, 16? Well, no, I, I think it, um, it was 15 years since um, we met. Certainly team building, but yeah. I think you came up for my 70th birthday about five or six years ago. Right, right. But we first met about Oh, we first years met ago. about oh yes, at least 15 years ago. Yeah. So yes, and you've always you've you've uh, I, uh, a big thank you to uh to Johnny and for those who uh, are coming to Thailand, it's always nice to meet someone like Johnny who helps them out in their very early years when they're clueless idiots running around not knowing how things work in Thailand. So thank you, thank you for being very kind to me in our early years. <laughs> As, as uh, I probably mentioned uh, already in the intro, we, we used to work together doing sort of, sort of team building consulting uh, years ago, and that's how we know each other. But um, you have been retired in Thailand for how long now? Oh, 21 years now. I, I retired at the end of 2000. Uh, yes, in 2000. Okay. Uh, so that's why you're on the show, because I, I, I really want to get your insights into 
into this sort of uh, whole area of life in Thailand because, you know, I'm not getting any younger myself. And <laughs> as I approach that maybe age, I think I'd, I'd like to learn a bit more. We've also gotten a lot of uh, emails over the time from our listeners who are curious about this too. Right. So I thought you'd be a good person to have on the show. Now, you uh, have a really interesting background in that you're actually, uh, we call you the colonel because you are actually a real colonel, Colonel Johnny Thoits. You were real the, one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a genuine British colonel. Uh, can you just sort of give us a background on, on how, how that happened and how you ended up in Thailand? Well, I've been, I was a soldier all my, all my, all my life. And um, my last two jobs in the army was, first of all, in Italy, where I was the defense attache in Rome. And then when I only had three years or so left to serve, because they throw us out at 55, (laughs) um, they asked if I wanted to come to Bangkok. So I said, I thought about it for approximately a nanosecond and said, yeah, I think I could cope with that. So I spent the last six years or so of my my military career in the diplomatic service. So what is what exactly is an attaché? Well, he's the he's the link between the Ministry of Defence in the UK and and the ambassador here wherever it is and also the uh the military of that particular country. Okay. So you actually work for the ambassador as well as working for the Ministry of Defence. And there, there isn't often a, a conflict of interests. But if there is, you basically do what the ambassador tells you and then get on the phone to the Ministry of Defense and say, okay, what's the form, guys? <laughs> okay, so, so you're like the, the, the mediator, the in-between. The- Very much so, but, but the Ministry of Defense are the guys who really set your, set your program. Uh, although in my days, I had, I had a pretty free reign. Um, over here, you, you tended to deal with things like sales, military sales, as well as exercises and people going back to the UK on military courses and all this sort of thing. Um, some countries, there is a, a special sales representative, but in, in, in my day, they're just taking him away. And so I used to deal with sales. Um, now it's all a bit different. And I think um, I, I, I really can't say what goes on now because I'm 20 years out of date. Yeah. But I am still in touch with attaches here. Um, and I think they're much less free than I was as far as setting your own agenda was concerned. Right. Okay. All right. So when you retired in Thailand, you, I mean, did you ever, did you have plans of retiring here when you first came here? No, not really. Um, I was, before they tossed you out. Yes. Uh, my, my wife and I divorced while we were in Thailand. It got nothing to do with Thailand. I mean, this was, this was going to happen anyway. So basically I was, if you like, footloose and fancy free anyway. You right. know, we, we'd sold the house in England and all that sort of thing. So when retirement time came up here, um, uh, I'd already been, been approached by the team building lot. Um, British Executive Service overseas wanted me as their rep here. And also um, there was the, the Thailand Burma Railway, which we were setting up up in Kanchanaburi. Um, and so I had quite a lot going on. So I thought, well, heck, you know, I've got nothing in England now. Um, why don't I stay and carry on for a bit, which I duly did. And then it seemed pretty sensible to actually make more of a, a point about retiring here. Yeah. Um, so that was really why I stayed on. I had no, no initial plans to do so. Uh, the longer I live here, the more I meet people with that story, like myself. Yeah. Like, oh, I came over here, didn't know what was going to happen, and and then snap your fingers and a couple of decades have gone by. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, I met Deng um, while I was in this sort of limbo period. Um, Deng just your, a, your wife. She's my wife now. And and she used to come up with me into the, the Karen Hill Tribes area where I had a, a certain interest. Um, the great thing about Deng is she understood my Thai um, and although she, her English was fairly limited, we could communicate. So she came up and sort of acted as a bit of an interpreter. And he sort of went on from there. And I lived for, with, for three years in Bangkok. And then we built a house down near her head. Yeah. Um, and I, I asked her to marry me in 2006. And it sort of went on from there, really. Um, so we've been together for a long time. Oh, cool, mm-hmm. cool, cool. Now, <clears throat> you first, when I first met you, you were living in Bangkok. Uh, and then you moved to Hua Hin. You built a house in Hua Hin. 
And now, right now, we're sitting at your uh, living room table in uh, Nakon Rachasima in Korat, where you built a house up here. Um, so you've been you've you've been uh, north, south, central. Uh, so you've 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 gone around a little bit. And when you first retired, let's talk about retirement. When you first retired, was it easy to sort of decide and get through the process and the paperwork? And did you have to mentally prepare yourself for that? Or mm, yes, it it wasn't it wasn't a problem. <clears throat> what I did discover very quickly, though, was that once you come off your perch uh, of a fairly high-powered job and dealing with a lot of high-so people, you suddenly are just like every other farang in this country. Right. Um, and so you've got no special um, in as far as, say, immigration or something like that is concerned. So I had to go down to immigration in Bangkok, apply for a tourist visa, go out to Malaysia, um, get the stamp, come back in, apply for the, for the retirement so, visa. So like the guy in front of the line, in, yeah. in the line in front of you was like some <laughs> douche cow sand backpacker. And then you come up and you're like, hello, hello, hello quote unquote, Colonel. It's welcome. <laughs> so that was something you, 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 I had to come to terms with very quickly. Right. Um, and, you know, suddenly that, there was no special treatment at all. And well, it's funny because we're, we're sitting in your living room and, and some of these photos we'll send out to our patrons as we always do. <laughs> I, I took some pictures on your wall here. You're, you've you're, you're got photos with Pope John Paul. You've got photos with all these military leaders around the world, all everyone in their smart dress, military yeah. uniforms, you know. Yeah, and to go from that to sitting at immigration with Joe Schmo from, you know, who hasn't cut his hair in 16 months. <laughs> it's it, it's a good leveler, to be honest. Um, it, it really is. What's quite interesting about it, though, is because taking this country, um, I mean, I worked in, in Bangkok with, you know, senior people and the elite, as they get called nowadays. And then it was Hua Hin and then coming back here. So we did a lot of work with the business community team building. And up here, we're very much in a village community. Um and it's quite interesting seeing the the reactions to Farang and from the different communities. And the one thing about Bangkok I discovered was that so many of them have absolutely no idea about how people live up country. And I mean, I think the first person who really did was and understood was, was Taksin for all his faults. Um, people up here loved him. And why? Yeah. Because he was the only politician that ever done anything for them. Um, whatever his background reasons, they weren't concerned. All they knew was that they were getting some sort of benefit out of it. That's really uh, an interesting thing when you get up out of Bangkok. And like we say on the podcast before, Sukhumvit is not Bangkok and Bangkok is not Thailand. And once you get out into the boonies, into the, into the rural communities, you really get the feeling that Bangkok is a million miles away and they people up here couldn't care less what goes on in Bangkok. Yeah. So while we're down in Bangkok worrying about protests and stuff like that, it's, I mean, it's okay. Yeah, that's going on, but there, it's a whole different universe up here. Yeah, it is. Uh, and I mean, the people up here, I mean, I sometimes go to, to get my hair cut in the PMI and um, they're just not interested about what's going on in Bangkok. Right. I mean, they simply aren't, you it know. It has zero yeah, effect on yeah, their daily life. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So when you retired, uh, you lived in Bangkok for a while, first retired. Yeah. You were in Bangkok for a while. Uh, did you like Bangkok? Mm, I've never been a city person. And so I was quite happy to to get out. And we built between Hua Hin and Pranbury. And that was very nice. It was pleasantly quiet out what, of the country. Why did you go there? Um, no particular reason, except that I had I had quite a lot to do when I was the, the attache with the military in Pranbury. We got some peacekeeping um, carders over from England to teach the Thais about peacekeeping. And um, I got to know a, a colonel down there very well. And uh, I was talking with him about, you know, moving out. And he said, well, there are various bits of land. You might be, come, might be interested to come and have a look, you know, and which is basically how we ended up down there. And the great thing about Hua Hin area was that it's close enough to Bangkok to be able to, to, to go. I mean, it was a two and a half hour trip. Um, not like here, where you're nearly four hours away. Right. But, you know, a couple of hours, two and a half hours from, from Hua Hin wasn't a big problem. And so it was actually a nice place to be. Yeah, it's it, it's a pretty nice little town. Downtown Hua Hin has gotten pretty congested these days. No, it's changed enormously. I mean, we left there 
uh, seven years ago right. to come up here. And I go back occasionally uh, for whatever reason. And uh, you're right, it has changed. And I think it's changed mainly because of the sheer amount of traffic. Yeah. At peak times, getting through the middle of town can be kind of, it's like driving through Pattaya in the middle of the And trying to park. You know, yeah, you know, it's ridiculous. Nightmare. G- giant malls and everything <laughs> down there. But I have a little bit outside of town. It's lovely. It is. It's yeah. very pleasant. There's I've a- still got some land down there. And, um, you know, which we'll, we'll, uh, we're trying to sell. It's only a couple of rye, but it's, it's a nice spot, actually. It really is. Very pleasant. How do you find the Thais uh, see Farang retirees? Are, they, are you welcomed? Are you sort of an oddity that just sort of um, tolerated? <laughs> I've, personally speaking, I've never had any problems. Um, I mean, I can speak some Thai, not well, but I, enough to get by with. Um, and I think that if you, if you accept that the things that they do and the way that they do things, are different from yours and that you're not trying to 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 change them and you're certainly not shouting the odds because if you try to do that you just don't get anywhere right um then i think yeah i've always found them very friendly um very welcoming never had a i've never had a, a what i call as a, a problem of xenophobia having said that some of the my farang contacts um, have had a different different experience. And frankly, I, I suspect that it's much more down to them than it is to the Thais. Yeah, possibly. I still meet people that get really mad when they hear the word Faran. They take it as a, like a personal insult. But it's, I mean, it's, that's, that's yours. That's, that's the way it is. Yeah. What The word that upsets me more than anything else is the alien. <laughs> <laughs> Farang doesn't worry me, but to be an alien... <laughs> <laughs> and we were we were also uh, chatting earlier, and you said that the uh, the phrase that bothers you a lot is the my pen rye. Well, yes, this is part of the whole thing. I mean, I think that if you if you see something or you hear something that is clearly wrong, not just culturally different, but but wrong, then I think you say so, and you try to ensure that it that it doesn't happen again. But the the Thai attitude of my pen rye. And then perhaps not talking about something in the hopes that by not doing so, it'll go away. It doesn't, you know, if you don't talk about something or you don't see something, you don't look at it, it's not there. It doesn't happen. Out of sight, out of mind. Out of sight, out of mind. And I, this is my Ben Rye attitude. And that does make me cross sometimes. And I, I do find, I, I do say something now. I don't shout, no. I, I've learnt that that doesn't get you anywhere. Um, it's like people cutting you up in the, in, on the road. There's no point flashing your lights and getting really uptight and road rage coming on. You know, yeah. it, it doesn't get you anywhere. And I think what you've got to do as a Farang in this country or an expatriate in this country is that you've got to accept that things are done differently in some ways. You don't have to agree with them, but don't try to change them. Right. No, I think that's that's something that our yeah. friend Scott says that you know as well. Our, yeah. Uh, he said, don't don't try to change Thailand. Let Thailand change you. And you see Farang getting really uptight and under <laughs> the collar. And sadly, you see it in immigration, yeah. which is, of course, the wrong place to get uptight and un- right. lose your rag. You know, you- the, the one guy <laughs> in Thailand that has direct control over your your future. So speaking of immigration, let's let's talk about uh, you live up in, in um, Nakhon Rachasima right now, a.k.a. Korat. It took me a few years to figure out that Korat and Nakhon Rachasima were the same place. <laughs> um, so as a retiree now, what, what, what do you need? Say, say uh, you know, Joe Schmo comes over here and wants to retire. Uh, what's, what's the process like? Well, assuming that um, the good Joe is, is of retirement age. <clears throat> Which is 55? Uh, yes, I th- yes, it is 55 here, I think. I I may be wrong, and it may be 60, but I have a feeling it is 55. You've got to be over 55. But I'm not sure. I mean, I was over that anyway when I, when I left. Um, it's actually f- fairly easy to get a retirement visa. I mean, it was easier when, when I first started because I used to produce to the embassy my proof of pension. The embassy would give me a letter saying they had seen proof of pension and the amounts, and I used to take that down to immigration. 
what's happened now is that immigration want that money to be in country. So they said to the embassies, you need to verify that, that this money is not just, doesn't it just exist, but it's in country. Embassies quite rightly said, not our problem. Ergo, letters from the embassy are now no good and you have to, <clears throat> excuse me, produce the money in country. Hmm. Now, it, now I, I was talking to you yesterday and I, I thought it was 400,000 baht. 400,000 is what you need for a marriage visa plus lots of other bits and pieces. Yeah. Or I think it's 40,000 baht a month, steady, regular income. For a retirement visa, you need 800,000 baht in the bank. In a Thai bank. In a Thai bank. Or you need an income of 65,000 baht a month. Okay. Uh, which in sterling terms is now quite a lot of money. I mean, my 800,000 baht that I have in a Thai bank is now some 22,000 quid. Um, when I first came over here and did that, it was about 12,000 quid. Oh, wow. That's quite a difference. It is. So consequently, it just sits there. <laughs> and you can only use half of it anyway. Why? Because you have to have the whole amount there, I think three months before your visa renewal and three months after. And for the intervening six months, you've got to have 400,000 there. Oh. So you can only use half of it in any case. And then you've got to, with it, if you do take it out, you've got to top it back up um, three months, three months before. before the visa. So this, of course, is wholly illogical because if that money is there to sustain you and the Thais want to know that you've got enough money to look after yourself, how? why can you only take out 400,000 of it? You know, it doesn't make sense. Right, but waving your arms and squawking about it at immigration is not going to make them go, you know what, that's you're right. right. Let's that's, change the whole system. That, that's it. Yeah. 800,000 is, is quite a chunk of money. It's a lot of money. It's yeah. a lot of money to have sitting around doing nothing. And I think the last year when they closed the borders so that the people who were here on short-term visas couldn't go out and renew them, and they changed the system so that, uh, exactly a year before, they changed the system so you had to have the money in country for marriage and retirement visas. This actually did produce a certain exodus of Farang. Uh, the exodus by the guy on short-term visas, because they simply couldn't get out to renew, uh, in spite of the extensions that immigration kept producing, um, one of the problems was that immigration quite often didn't uh, announce the extension until, in one case, actually after the due date. <laughs> so consequently, people were sitting around saying, what am I going to do? Right. And if you can't stay, there's only one thing you can do, and that's go. Right. Um, so, and the the fact that you had to suddenly have all this money in Thailand for a retirement visa, some people said, "I can't do it." You know, it was it was okay when the you produced your your pension letters to the embassy, and the embassy said, "Yeah, fine, okay, I've seen you've got hundred thousand baht a month, whatever it is." You know. Um, but if you had to have 65,000 a month or 800,000 in Thailand, that produced a lot of problems for people, particularly with the parlous state of the baht and the, and the pound. Yeah, yeah. Wow. That's something to keep an eye on. That'll really change, well, it is. change the I landscape mean, of the whole I thing. mean, I, we had quite a big group of golfers here in Korat, and we've lost about four or five of them. Really? Yeah. And, and we were also talking about... Uh, what it's like after you've retired here. Um, you and I were talking the other day about going back to our respective countries, if that would ever happen. And I was saying, you know, I've been gone for 20 years and Canada is not the country that I remember. What I, what I think of as Canada it doesn't exist anymore. And as a retiree, what, what do you think about going back home? I mean, I, I guess you can, you can think of it when you, when you retire in Thailand, you can think I'm going to retire here and that's it, or I'm going to retire here for a little while and then head back home. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Uh, I mean, expatriates tend to look at their home country through rose-colored spectacles that are 20 years out of date or how many years it is. And so when you go back, you expect things to be as they were, and of course they're not. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, you have to ac accept that. I don't think it's as bad for someone like myself because, um, 
you know, after 37 years in the army, um, moving around the world, not really living in England that often, you go back after three years in Germany or three years somewhere else, you're quite used to going back and seeing how things have changed. Um, but yeah, I haven't been back to England now for three years. Um, and each time I go back, I think, God, how badly expensive it is. <laughs> um, and things have changed. I'm not sure I could actually afford to live in England. No. I mean, I don't have a house, so I'd either have to rent or buy something. Yeah. And it is, to me now, unbelievably expensive. Okay, I'm thinking in terms of what prices were maybe last time I lived there, which was a long time ago. Um, but nevertheless, I come back and I think, yeah, okay, um, I've made my, made, made my bed, and I think... I've probably done the right thing. Yes, there are problems here. Of course there are. Mm. Um, but there are problems wherever you're going to live at the end of it. So, um, and there are niggles. The niggle at the moment is, of course, my brother and sisters are older than me, and it's very difficult for me to get back and see them. Especially in fact, these days. Well, these days it's an impossibility. Not so much that if I went back... <clears throat> I wouldn't have, I'd have to self-quarantine in, in the UK coming from Thailand. But coming back to Thailand is a nightmare. Nightmare now. Mm. Um, and, and an expensive nightmare too. Yeah. So, yes, the coronavirus problem has exacerbated that. So I have no idea when I'm going to be able to get back. Right. Um, yeah, same as me. I mean, my, my, well, my folks live in Panama. Oh, yeah. gosh. I mean, how the hell do I... What do I need to yeah. figure out to get down to Panama for a visit these days? Mm. So, I don't, mm. so how has how has um, life changed for expats in Thailand over the past twenty or so years for you? What have been your observations? I don't know that things have changed too much. Um, I mean, I think if twenty years ago someone had told me that the Thais were afflicted with xenophobia, I probably wouldn't have believed them. Um, but I think there is an underlying trend uh, of a certain xenophobia. I mean, why em immigration, for example, treats us all Farangs as though we were sort of quasi-criminals. Uh, or aliens. Or aliens. <laughs> I don't really know. Um, it, it's difficult sometimes to come to terms with it. I mean... Immigration certainly is the burr under the expat saddle. There's no question about that. Because I've never had a problem with a visa. Never had a problem with a visa. But every time you go, there's some niggle. There's something changed. They haven't announced it or, or whatever. Right. And it's certainly um, the whole bureaucratic process is not designed to be easy. It's not a friendly country uh, for from the point of view of welcoming expats in to stay. They make life very difficult. You can't own land, you can't own a house, you can't, uh, I mean, everything that we own, frankly, is dengs. Now, I'm very happy with that. At 75, I would be. But, you know, you, you would look at countries like Malaysia or Vietnam or so on, and this is not the case. Right. I mean, in Malaysia, you can actually become a resident automatically after five years. Christ, I've been here tw over 20 years, and I'm still going to report to immigration every 90 days. You still have to do that, isn't it? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I was talking to a, a, a friend of mine who was the, he had been the deputy head of the Thai Navy at one time. Unfortunately, he's died now, but I used to go and play golf with him. And this guy was amazed that I, I still had to do this. He said, but you're married. And you're a, you're a Thai resident, aren't you? And I said, uh, no. <laughs> And this was the first time that I really came to understand that very senior people in Bangkok actually had very little idea of what we had to cope with uh, as a sort of expat community. Mm. And I think long-term residents like me, who've been here a long time, uh, get a bit cross when we're all lumped in with, you know, the guy down in Pattaya or Pat Pong or Phuket, who's overstayed his visa, is here anyway, and uh, we're all lumped into the to the same um, melting pot, if you like, as far as immigration is concerned, and that actually does bug us. 
Yeah. So from their perspective, there's no difference between you and, you know, Joe Schmo on Kalsan Road, who's just rolled off of a van from yeah. St. Louis. And I mean, the point is that, that we do bring in a lot of money into this country. I mean, you, you've mentioned the houses that I built uh, either down in Hua Hin or, or up here. Uh, we support Thai families. We actually support the local communities hell of a lot more than I think he's given credit for. And I think if Farang did go en masse, I see no reason why they should, they, they go, don't get me wrong, um, they would miss it. Yeah, I mean, right right now, I'm sitting here, sorry, Cap, I see your two little nieces, nieces over yeah. here, your Dang's kids. Say, you want to say hello? No? Oh, she's shy. <laughs> you know, they're running around, and then their mom, she, she lives in a little house on your property, and then you've got the brother-in-law and who, you know. You know, there's, there's half a dozen, eight people living in yeah. your little compound here, you know, and it's a nice little family you've got built here. So we do actually bring in a lot of money into, it, certainly the rural areas. Um, in Bangkok, I'm sure it's probably the same. You know, you, you probably have mother or sister or someone around as well. And so you're producing a lot of money. Mm. Um, the last count, I think I've got 12 people living in my condo. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of an exaggeration. Okay. Right. Sometimes feels that way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I decided ages ago that I was going to stay here. I couldn't afford to live in England and in Thailand or in Italy, which I had thought about, and in Thailand. And so I thought, right, okay, um, I'm content to to stay here. I'm married. Uh, I'm, um, I've got no real ties, you know. I'm perfectly happy. I was doing a lot of work team building um, as a consultant. Um, and, um, okay, since I've actually retired, retired, time can occasionally hang a bit heavy on my hands, no question. I miss not going out and lecturing or something like that. Right. Okay. I can't run around with a team now like I used to, but I do miss a certain interaction with, with, with groups. But having said that, I'm perfectly content um, to stay here. Um, but if you ask if that, I will probably ask any Farang, what would you like to see change most? I think we'd all say, reform immigration, yeah. get them into the 21st century. I, I we joke on the show and I, my theory is that uh, Thai bureaucrats are like sharks. They, they, need, <laughs> they need a minimum amount of water or red tape to live. Uh, anything below that and just why, why are we doing this at all? So they need, they need a minimum amount of, of, of confusion and, yeah. and paperwork yeah. uh, to, to sort of justify their own existence. <laughs> and why did you choose uh, Korat? Well, this was because it was Deng's part of the part of the country. Okay, uh, this was her village. Um, she, when she was working in Bangkok, she'd bought a little bit of land across the road, which she built a small house for her mum on. Um, when we got together, we she was offered this patch here, uh, and I said, "Go get it." You know, I mean, it was rice field at that time, um, and um, it sort of developed from there. So. This is her neck of the woods. And the important thing about living in your wife's neck of the woods, I think, is that there is this system of, the Thais call it op-un, uh, this family, extended family sort of relationship. When we were living in Hurhin, it didn't happen. It wasn't Deng's part of the world. Now we're up here, you have a slight problem, big sister, not too well, whatever it may be, uh, or mum. People come along and help. They don't. They don't ring you up and say, do you need some help? They just come along. Mm. And, they, and that is something which I think we as a Farang don't have now in our home countries. I think this is gone, um, this sort of op-un, this extended family relationship. And I think that's, that is all credit to the Thais. Um, how much longer it will exist like this, nah, that's a different, different, different question. Kettle of fish. Yeah. So uh, wrapping up then as the last question, would you do this all again to Thailand? <laughs> yeah, $64,000 question, <laughs> as they used to say. Um, <clears throat> I think that if I was up to the point of retiring now and having to make that decision, I think I would probably have to say no. And it's really to do with the the parlous state of the Baht and the pound, which really 
is a big problem for um, certainly Brits and pro uh, probably Americans now. Um, and the bureaucracy, which is far worse now than it was when I, when I first started moving It's in. worse now. It is far worse. Um, and there are other countries that make Farang much more welcome. And I think, I, to be honest with you, I don't think Thailand has an enormous amount going for it now in the way that it used to for expatriates to come here and retire. You know, it, it's expensive, it's bureaucratic, and there are other places that are much more Farang friendly. So much as I regret to say so, I think I would probably say no if I had to make that decision now. Interesting. Which is sad, actually. Yeah, yeah. But now that you're here, I mean, you're quite comfortable. Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm content to be here and stay here. And right. as I said, I have, I have very few problems. Um, and certainly, I'm lucky we've got a good immigration set up down here, and I, I haven't had any trouble. Yeah. Um, so, no, I'm content to, to, to be here and stay here. But it's sad when I think of um, people who would like to come to a lovely country, let's face it. I mean... You feel the same way as yeah, I do, yeah. I'm sure. About it. I think there's also an element of, of uh, like you said, rose-tinted glasses. I mean, uh, now you and me both say like, oh, you should have been here 20 years ago. It was much better then. And then 20 years ago, I met people that said, oh, you should have been yes, here 10 years yes, ago. It was yes, much yes, better yes, then. So yes. I think it's a perspective thing yeah, as well. well. There is. You're quite right. You know? yeah. So final question then. Uh, one, one, one thing we like to do is we give our $5 patrons a chance to ask, ask questions via us to our upcoming guests. So I've got two questions here from, uh, from Eric, if you don't mind. And Eric says, what health insurance do you carry and what has been your general experience in working with insurers? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm quite lucky because I have an O visa. I have a retirement O visa, which doesn't force me to have insurance. Oh. Um, having said that, I have insurance, um, but it costs me an arm and a leg, as you can imagine, at 75. Um, I have it with a big company. Um, so I, I have it, but I'm not forced to have it here. The, the problem really is that whether I was with this company or whether I would change and go to any other company, it's very difficult to change when you're older. And secondly, you have quite a big excess. I mean, the excess on my insurance, in other words, what I have to pay if I go into a hospital, is quite extensive. Right. So, so you, you've got to pay the first... I've got to pay, expense, in my case, the first 80,000 baht. Um, so really, I've got to be in a, quite a serious way before I start claiming on my insurance mm. to go into a hospital. I mean, if you're going to have a, a hernia or whatever, it costs you thirty or 40,000 baht, I mean, I'm paying for it. Right. So I don't have a problem with it. Um, and I find the, the, um, the hospitals here very good. Um, as long as you don't go to the Bangkok Hospital in Korat, which is expensive. But having said that, the, the service is great. Um, insurers, no, they're all about the same. And I've been to a couple of agents recently and discovered that if I change, I'm paying about the same anyway. So, Right, so six of one half to yeah, exactly. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And second question from Eric, he says, what are some things you wish you had handled differently when you started your Thailand retirement? Yeah, that's, that's, that's quite a, a, a tricky one. And I think... Probably the only thing that I would have gone for would have been Thai residency rather than just going from year to year to year as a retirement um, person. I mean, I've spoken to quite a few chums of mine who, who had Thai residency, and I think I didn't go because of a combination of expense, inertia, um, procrastination. <laughs> uh, and at the time, I didn't really know how I was going to spend the rest of my life here. Right. Um, but I think in hindsight, I think that is what I think that is the thing to go for. Either that or go the whole hog and go for citizenship, which I think is probably a very, if you've made the decision to stay here, that's probably quite a good way to go. But other things... No, I, I I don't think I would have done anything different. Um, no, no, I can't think of anything. Well, it seems to have worked out pretty well. Yeah. I'm sitting here in your lovely room. Thank you for a bacon and eggs breakfast this morning, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> That's good. 
Well, Colonel, thank you so much for, for sharing your insights and coming on the show. It's great to see you again. And uh, being uh, four hours away is a bit of a pain in the ass. You don't get to see uh, your friends as much, but but uh, you've got a nice little life up here and a great little house and uh, many continued successes in your chicken rearing. And uh, well, thanks very much, Greg, and and thanks for coming up here. It's been it's been great to actually catch up with you again. It really has. You yeah, know. yeah. I'm sorry, Kellen didn't make it, but uh, never mind. You well, know. I mean, it's only a Six-year-old, if he wants to go on a four-hour <laughs> four road trip to see a bunch of people yes. he's never Dad, met. Dad, are we there yet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Johnny. Not and, at all, uh, Greg. Take care. No, good to see you. Well, I got to say, I'm glad that uh, he offered a very uh, even-handed perspective. Uh, you and I have talked about this many times. Uh, I think uh, sometimes uh, expats... Um, and even tourists, sometimes they just romanticize Thailand and they, they just think this is dreamland for expats and retirees. And so I, I'm glad he gave a, a, a more even-handed take. Yeah, and um, it's, it's funny because we did a recent show too on uh, you know, what happens if you lose your job in Bangkok. Right, sure. And it's the same thing. He, like he was saying, he, he's been here for 20, 30 years and he's been paying taxes because, you know, he was like, he was, he was a, he was a big name in, in the military circles, which in Thailand carries a lot of weight. Sure. Um, and once he became a retired person, he was just on the same playing field as, you know, Joe Schmo, who just rolled off a boat from Koh Samui after smoking weed for three weeks, you know? So <laughs> right, it's, right, it's, right. it's like, it's a bit of a disconnect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, clearly he's liked it enough to stay. Um, and, uh, and, and you and I love this place enough to stay, but, uh, we try to keep it real, you know, that's our thing. So, uh, I, I, I like this kind of take it, uh, you know, I didn't know what to expect from the interview. And if he, if he would have told this unbelievable story about how this was the perfect place to retire, I don't know. I, I, I don't think I would have liked it as much. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. I've retired in 12 countries around the world and Thailand wins. <laughs> no, but Johnny's such a great guy and he's, he's a, he's a proper old, you know, British, uh, gentleman right. of, of means. Um, and he, he's always great to sit down and chat because he's, like you said, he's very even hand, even keeled. He's knowledgeable. He's smart. He's analytical. And he doesn't sort of have a lot of biases that come out all the time. So he's, he's just a really cool person to know. And everyone should be so lucky uh, to have a friend like Johnny. He really helped me out in my early years here. So big thanks to CJT, Colonel Johnny Thoits for coming on the show. And hopefully we can Absolutely. get up to, uh, hopefully we can get up to Corrad again in the near future and have another yeah. barbecue and a beer. Cause I really enjoyed my time. Yeah, and for our listeners, if you are thinking of retiring in Thailand, certainly do not cross Thailand off the list. This is a great place in many respects. But just make sure you know what you're getting into and make sure you know some of some of the potential cons. Yeah, I would agree. I, I think it's I think I, I'm I'm planning to retire here. I've got no qualms about that at all. But it but it ain't for everyone. So No doubt, no doubt. Do your research. All right, let's do some love, loathe, or live with, where one of us picks a particular aspect of living in Bangkok, which we then discuss and decide if it's something we love about living here, loathe about living here, or have come to accept as something that we just have to learn to live with, no matter how we feel about it. And this week, Ed, it's all you. All right, Greg, I know you're going to know what I'm talking about. And I think, you know, uh, most expats have just come to accept this, but maybe it's one of those things that we shouldn't have come to accept. So okay. here, here, here's my here's my thing. Just the frequency, uh, uh, the, the, the commonplace nature of having to give someone a copy of your passport. I feel like I've given people hundreds or maybe even thousands of copies of my passport over the years. It's like, no matter what I want to do, they're always like, can I have your passport? Can I have your passport? And I got to sign it. And it's, I, I feel like pretty soon when I go buy a mango on the street, I'm going to have to <laughs> give them a copy of my passport. Buy a mango on the street. All right, let me see your passport. No. Seriously, oh, you know what I'm talking about. Like, you you need a new SIM card. You like, you know, bank account. Uh, you you rent a jet ski. You rent a car. You rent a, a motorcycle. Um, anything. I, I, there's there's hundreds of copies of my passport just floating around Thailand. What a coincidence it would be if Som Chai, the mango seller's cousin, had just happened to have a photocopy shop right behind the, the right. mango <laughs> stall. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it. And I know, I know we. Like I said, we've of course we do it because you got to do it. But yeah, what's your take? Well, I I uh, I don't mind it. I would say I live with it. I mean, it's annoying. I don't enjoy it. Like, oh, you need more goddamn copies of my passport. Right, right. Um, but you know, I mean, Thailand is a country that functions 
with ID cards anyway. Like every Thai citizen has a national ID card. True and that. they they whip that out all the time. Like for my work, I, I have to go and sometimes I have to go to a different building to work. And uh, I, I have to get a visitor's badge. Um, but every Thai who comes in, they just have, they pull out their, their card and they give it to the woman and she like puts it in a little card reader hooked up to her computer. Beep. Right, right. So they know exactly who's there, when they were there, what they're doing, where they're going. So it's, it's a society, it's a martial society that sort of expects to track people with documentation. And as foreigners, we don't have a national ID card, so. Uh, I guess, okay, that is a valid point. I mean, you're right. Thai people have to put up with the same thing or, or perhaps even worse with their ID card. Because they, have, right, they, 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 get, they get that thing copied all the time. Like you, you Let know, me ask you like, this. If, if you had a Thai ID card and you were asked to whip that all the time, would it bother you the same way? Well, that's what I'm saying. I think, I think it is the number of times. I mean, you're right. I mean, now I see. I think your point is valid, and that I don't think we have any right to claim uh, any right to complain versus Thai people, whereas sometimes we do. Like as in like double pricing, we're like we just want to be treated like Thais. But in this case, I think we're all subject to this, and you know maybe loathe is a bit strong. I mean, it's not that big a deal, but I do find it it's annoying just the number of times like I, I like my, my passport is copied like isn't your passport supposed to be like an important mostly private document <laughs> I feel like I feel like half of Thailand has copied my passport yeah it's it's annoying I'll give you that it's, I mean I don't enjoy it but it doesn't bother me that much I mean save for save for the insane you know I've probably contributed to nine trees dying over the time in Thailand right. just giving out copies of my stupid passport but right that's another, that's another, another I, point I, I'm going to sure. live with on this one all right I'm going to go mild loathe all right. All right. Okay. A final thanks to our patrons who support the show. Patrons get a ton of cool perks and the warm, fuzzy feeling knowing that they're helping support the show. Find out more by clicking support on our website and connect with us online. We're Bangkok Podcast on social media, bangkokpodcast.com on the web, or simply bangkokpodcast at gmail.com. We love hearing from our listeners and always reply to our messages. Yes, we do. And you can also listen to each episode on YouTube. You can send us a voicemail online that we'll feature on the show or even reach out to me directly on Twitter or Instagram where I am PKK Greg. So thanks for listening, everyone. Take care out there. And we'll see you back here next week as usual. Absolutely. He used to be a high so like big wig in the Thai uh sort of like military circles, which which ain't ain't no thing. Right. Like it's, it's ain't no small thing, right? Yeah. Let me say that again. <laughs>